Hello there. Uh, welcome to this AHDB webinar focused on the American uh, marketplace. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Phil Hadley. I'm International Director for AHDB. Uh, and in the next 75 minutes, we'll talk about the opportunities for uh, the North American marketplace and the trade dynamics. And I'll give a brief overview of the AHDB role on the export markets. And we'll be joined by two speakers today. Dana Dickerson, who's Head of Food and Drink uh, for North America in the Department of International Trade uh, based in Canada. Hi, Dana. And Susanna Morris, who's in the export team at AHDB, and she's responsible for the North American uh, market and our activities in the area. So I will now uh, turn off my camera so the slides uh, can be seen at maximum view and uh, give a brief overview of uh, AHDB and our export uh, work. Next slide, please. So that's the int introduction of, um, of the purpose of today. Uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, the role of AHDB, our speakers who I've just introduced briefly. Uh, we'll take questions via the toolbar on your control panel. If you'd like to submit some questions via the toolbar, we'll tackle those at the end of the session. We're going to have presentations till around 3.45 and then take about 30 minutes for questions afterwards. So use the question tool. Uh, to submit your questions and the webinar is recorded and will be available afterwards on the AHDB website and YouTube channel should you wish to go back to any of those points or share with any of your colleagues. Okay next slide please. Okay so just to give some more uh, brief background really we're going to focus on red meat today the value of red meat exports uh, beef lamb and pork in 2019 was 1.5 billion pounds in sterling and our ambition here is to is to maintain our existing export sales uh, and values but also to grow into emerging th third countries as the global trade dynamic for protein changes graph there shows you how important the uh, percentage of exports are as, as a, a function of domestic production, lamb being the most critical and of course being very seasonal as well, but we're exporting a significant amount of lamb, most notably to uh, near Europe uh, and uh, significant value uh, in terms of pork and for beef, so an important role across the red meat sectors uh, for exports. Next slide please. What do we do as AHDB? Well, we have a number of uh, functions and activities across the export uh, piece, including technical market access. So working very closely with uh, UK government and other departments and the UK Export Certification Partnership, which some of you will be aware of. A genuine partnership approach to achieving market access and maintaining market access. And we've been very successful of late in gaining access to uh, new and emerging markets. We host outward missions to those new and growing markets to support our stakeholders in terms of building relationships and, uh, uh, and understanding the marketplace. We support trade shows, again about reputation building, the UK PLC reputation, and to provide a presence and a platform for our stakeholders and an opportunity to, to meet uh, overseas buyers. We have an in-market presence, which I'll come on to talk about in a bit more detail, which we're currently expanding to reflect those growing opportunities. And we also collaborate and support with a number of organisations and particularly UK government overseas through the local embassies, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, and the DIT network. And, and Dane is an example of that, being a representative from DIT in, in Canada. Uh, so that relationship is very important to us in taking the uh, local understanding and local trade opportunities forward. We also work in partnership with UK government uh, in supporting the role of food and agricultural councillor uh, based in China um, to drive our market access and market growth opportunities. And then we have an office in Brussels which is focused on EU policy and impact evaluation. So looking forward, obviously UK's relationship with Europe is changing and will continue to change and that will be critical to help us understand the trading environment and the uh, legislation requirements in continuing to trade our products with our nearest neighbours and most important markets in the EU countries. Okay, next slide please. 
In terms of what does the team look like, um, this uh, picture is really just to show the, the depth and the breadth of the team uh, and the regions we're active in. So starting with near Europe, Remy Fourier in our office based in France covers Europe and Northeast, uh, sorry, Middle East, North Africa, uh, with a network of agents covering those key countries. And a number of you will be familiar with our representatives uh, in Europe. But we also have um, expanding our operation in uh, the Asia Pacific region with John, uh, Jonathan Eckley uh, heading that activity and expanded recently by appointing agents uh, in Japan and China. We already support the role of Food and Ag Council, as I mentioned. We have a permanent position Holly Chen through the uh, China Britain Business Council uh, in terms of helping grow our trade development work there. Should add, Remy's recently recruited a representative in the uh, Middle East, and Susanna will go on to talk about more details on the American side. But a PR agency has recently been recruited uh, in America, and she'll have uh, more detail on that shortly. Next slide, please. So in terms of the market access work, we've experienced a number of recent successes to grow these third country opportunities. Uh, and uh, from a US perspective, we already have pork access and we are currently in the late stages of uh, achieving beef access uh, to turn that into commercial trade. We have ongoing dialogues with a number of other countries, mainly uh, Asian markets, because that's where we're seeing the most uh, growth. We have access to Canada, um, uh, via an EU type agreement and in terms of export health certificates uh, UK government through AFA has recently updated revisited and made electronic a number of those export health certificates to speed up the process and make it an export uh, of products uh, an easier uh, and uh, more expedited process so the website there for those of you that are generating and completing export health certificates if you're not aware there are 70 odd export health certificates up there now which are electronic and you can visit that website and establish if they're relevant to you i should also add on the access we we'll also enter a number of markets by uh, the agreement around vision of high quality genetics from the uk and that's obviously uh, on occasions the precursor to stock talking about meat and then that leads into the commercial trade of those products. And all, all this work is, as I said, conducted uh, in close partnership with UK government and a multitude of departments through the UK Export Certification Partnership. Okay, next slide, please. Clearly, we're in strange times at the moment. Uh, a number of you will be familiar with our international trade show program and some examples of some pictures uh, of trade stands. A lot of these have been disrupted as a result of COVID and travel restrictions, and they've been rescheduled. We work in partnership uh, with other levy bodies and uh, UK government in country uh, to deliver these trade stands. We are still delivering activity in country uh, through the network of people we have uh, in those respective countries, and we're looking at our trade show presence and what that looks like on an individual event basis as decisions are made around uh, putting on events and travel. But to visualise what those stands look like, we very much work in partnership with UK government using the Food is Great banner, which gets good recognition and good pickup overseas. And whilst I say it's disrupted at the moment, we are looking at events that are coming up and how we can still deliver a, a footprint and a platform for our stakeholders at those events, whilst also considering other opportunities, including virtual events such as this, but meet the buyer type events using that UK government network overseas to try and create virtual platforms uh, to continue the important work uh, whilst we are as disrupted as we are. Next slide, please. We're also conducting uh, market insight into a number of markets and publishing work uh, in this area. This is part of really understanding these markets to try and identify the growth opportunities and understand how overseas consumers actually view British products. Um, we have great uh, domestic insight in terms of consumer preference and choice, and it's a bit weaker on the overseas front. So we're currently building that through a suite of projects and work which we're making available to stakeholders to help understand what the key trends are in those markets and how uh, we can tap into those to really get the best growth opportunities that we can. 
Uh, next slide, please. So, and it's part of understanding the consumer in the given market. So we can build the awareness of UK products, understand the key purchase drivers, and tailor the messages accordingly to give ourselves the greatest opportunity of success in those markets and focusing on the messages that are key in individual markets. So we know, for example, in the US, um, sustainability and health credentials are important. We know in China, for example, food safety is important. So understanding those drivers means we can tailor the message for the country targeting. OK, next slide, please. And my uh, final slide, really uh, looking forward uh, from an AHD perspective, we exports continues to be a cr critical function for us and for our stakeholders and will remain a key part of the work that we do. And we're developing our approach to include more support in newly granted markets and those with the key growth opportunities. So China, Japan, US and Middle East, uh, new uh, representatives and agents uh, recruited there recently. And this will increase our ability to deliver on the ground, even in the conditions we have at the moment, and support the development and reputation building activities with our partners in country. And we'll also further improve our consumer insight work in the, those key markets so we can understand what drives purchase and exploit the potential that that reveals. Um, and I, I can't uh, finish without touching on Brexit and the importance of the EU market. It's critical for, for our exports. So whilst third countries are growing our opportunity, the EU has remained a cornerstone of our exports uh, and will continue to do so. So it's important that we maintain that market and maintain the access and the trade that we've secured over many years. Um, so looking forward, it will be one of free trade agreements and, and more liberalised trade, strong partnership with industry and government, uh, market intelligence built on insights, which will underpin the work we do on our reputation and help us understand and deliver on those opportunities presented. So with that, I will hand over to Dana Dickerson, Head of Food and Drink for North America in the Department of International Trade based in Canada. Thank you, Dana. Thanks, Phil. I'll just turn on my uh, video briefly so you guys can see me as I say hello. So um, as Phil mentioned, I'm Dana Dickerson. I'm the North America Head of Sector for Consumer Goods. I'm based in Toronto, Canada, but I lead our teams across the US and Canada. We have about 14 uh, trade professionals uh, supporting uh, consumer goods, including food and drink. Um, I'm just going to turn my video off now so we can focus on the slides and I'll ask uh, us to move to the next slide. So just a quick agenda of what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction to DIT North America and our work. Um, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of light touch context on the markets. I know Susanna is going to cover a bit more in depth later, um, but there's a lot to cover here between Canada and the US, very big markets, um, and I'll, as well a lot to cover on beef, pork, and lamb. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to generalize all that focus maybe a little bit more on beef because that's where we're seeing some of the immediate change with the, the access in the US coming. Um, and then I'm gonna give an overview of the current dynamics in the market given the disruption of COVID-19, what we're seeing on the ground and some thoughts on the prospects for the future. <clears throat> I'm also gonna do a little bit of a reminder of compliance best practice for the market as well. Can I move to the next slide? Okay, so just briefly, this is an overview of our teams across the market. So you have me in purple there, sat in Toronto, leading uh, both the US and the Canadian teams. And then the teams in red um, are the teams in Canada and the teams in blue are our teams in the US. So all of these folks cover uh, food and drink and support on trade promotion. Um, they're based uh, in, in the major cities sort of across uh, the, the US and Canada and their patches in terms of their provincial and state coverage is also highlighted there, um, as well as our email format. So if you wanna get in touch with any of them, uh, you can feel free to reach out to them and myself after the presentation. Um, so very large market, uh, we, are, we have LA and Vancouver that are eight hours behind the UK. Chicago is six hours, Toronto, New York and Miami are five hours difference. Um, three of our teams also cover the wider consumer goods sector beyond food and drinks, so products like retail. And then our teams in, um, New York and Toronto are more specialized specifically in the food and drink sector. Uh, I'd like to give special thanks to Jessica in Toronto and Yan in New York who supported me on research for this presentation. Uh, they were highly engaged in preparing some of the content for it. 
Uh, and I also like to mention, they're not shown on this uh, slide, but we have colleagues uh, Ingrid in Washington and Jennifer in Montreal, who cover trade policy uh, for the US and Canada respectively. So all the teams you'll see here are focused on trade promotion activity, but we also work really closely with our colleagues on the trade policy side. Next slide. Um, so just a quick overview of the type of work that we do in market. So we've got some images here um, from some of the activities that we've done. Uh, so I like to describe our work as four pillars. We do a lot of uh, educational and intelligence work. So supporting exporters and associations in their understanding of the market and dynamics on the ground, essentially doing webinars like this. Uh, business development is very much our bread and butter. So we support trade missions. We support inward buyer visits um, and promote UK presence at trade shows. Um, in normal times, obviously. So trying our best to generate more demand with um, purchasing stakeholders over here and connecting them to the supply in the UK. Uh, we also do trade and consumer promotion. So uh, B2B tasting events and trade marketing. We also work with the DEFRA Food is Great campaign um, to do consumer marketing that's specifically targeting the US and building up the reputation of, of the UK products there. So a couple of the images you'll see in here, the upper left hand corner is a uh, food is great signage that we installed outside the British High Commission in Ottawa. You'll see some nice lamb there on, on the one of the lower panels. Uh, the meat of the matter piece is uh, from Grocery Business Magazine, which is a uh, trade publication in Canada that we do a annual um, feature in kind of highlighting the strengths of the UK offer. Bottom left hand corner, you'll see uh, Susanna there, who you all know very well as well as uh, Greg uh, from Pickstock and Kevin from CNK. Uh, they came over for a trade mission in 2016, which we supported, and they're there with uh, Chef Danny McAllister from one of the best restaurants uh, in Toronto for steak, which we visited. You've got me supporting some lamb that had a retail listing uh, back in 2016 uh, in Canada. And then you've got a picture from one of our, um, actually this was a gin event that we did there, where we included, um, I believe in this picture, it is some lamb or perhaps haggis uh, that we included on the menu. So we definitely make a point to highlight British products um, at all of our events wherever possible. Next slide, please. Uh, so essentially, I'm gonna start off with just a brief Canadian market overview. Um, so just a general kind of uh, dip into it to give you a concept of the landscape uh, in normal times, sort of pre-COVID, what things look like. So we'll move to the next slide. So Susanna is going to cover a little bit of this later, so I won't dwell on this, but essentially just to give you a, a bit of an overview of, of Canada, we have a relatively small population um, comparative to our landmass, so about half the population of the UK, but spread across a territory that is 40 times the size of it by landmass. Um, most folks are located in the major cities along the border, uh, so you'll see um, big populations in Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Ottawa, and Calgary. Uh, we are politically, socially, and culturally distinct from the USA. Um, and you'll definitely see an more of affiliation with UK and European sort of tastes and flavors in Canada um, than you might see across the US just due to our linkages um, with uh, the UK and the, and the fact that the, the Queen remains our head of state. So scooting along to the next slide, thank you. Uh, oh. Sorry, I think we've had a little bit of glitch there on slides, but um, just moving along, I'll talk a little bit about the Canadian market characteristics. Um, so Canada is a significant global producer of beef and pork, as I'm sure most of you know. They're also a very active exporter. Um, we are highly integrated with the United States and we have significant foreign direct investment in Canada from the US uh, in the meat industry. So lots of big US producers are um, involved in Canada and the supply chain can be quite integrated. Um, high consolidation, only about seven companies control about 40% of the meat market. Um, and in general, we've been seeing um, a bit of a decline in beef and pork consumption over the years, though that rate of decline has been slowing. Scoot along to the next slide. Um, oh, I think it's uh, lagging a little bit, but um, so I'm not going to dwell again on sort of the Canadian production uh, of livestock and export because I know Susanna is also going to touch on this, um, but just some, some information there for your reference. Canada is one of the world's largest beef exporters um, and about 38% of our domestic slaughter in Canada is exported and about 74% of that actually goes to the United States. 
Uh, the next largest export markets for Canada for that are Japan, mainland China, Hong Kong, Mexico, Southeast Asia, and South Korea. Um, we shall scoot along to the next slide. And again, I'm not going to dwell too much, but just on pork production, you can see the numbers here, um, about 14 million hogs and on lamb, a significantly smaller production of lamb um, uh, with about 800,000 uh, sheep and lambs being produced. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so just a bit of a snapshot here for you guys on beef imports and volume. So this is um, what the first half of 2019 looked like last year just to give you a bit of a, a concept of what the competition looks like. Um, the US really dominates Canadian imports by volume. Um, you can see that there uh, with how significant they are. And then New Zealand and Australia, followed by Uruguay and Mexico, also have very significant market shares here. Um, uh, in 2020, when before COVID hit, imports were forecasted to remain relatively flat. Um, following a period of 6% overall decline in 2019. Um, increased domestic production and decreased consumption were really the main factors driving that trend. We'll move along to the next slide. Um, this is a very busy slide, but again, for some future reference for you, just to have a bit of a view of how things have changed over the years. Um, I've got the UK highlighted in green here. So I've been around with DIT since 2013. In 2015, in October, we achieved access into the Canadian market for UK beef, um, and we started to see product flow, but it wasn't until 2017 that we actually got um, a duty-free access under the CETA agreement, which changed things a little bit and allowed us to get more products in without tariffs being applied. Um, so you'll see some of the changes that went through over the years and the growth that we've seen there. Um, but the U.S. really dominates, as I mentioned earlier, um, the market for imported fresh beef, and they led the pack by value in 2019 with Mexico following. Um, through U the USMCA agreement, which is the new NAFTA agreement, the USA and Mexico have unrestricted duty-free access to Canada. Of course, they also have proximity and highly integrated supply chains. Um, so that's sort of one of the reasons that you see that. Um, the UK shipped a relatively small amount of fresh product in 2019, um, but you'll see uh, we did significantly more frozen in, in 2019. Um, Australia leads for imports in lead in 2019 for frozen, followed by New Zealand, Uruguay, and the US. Um, I can't really necessarily speak to the causality for the shift of value in each year, um, but the points I made earlier about when we achieve market access and the changes in quota um, do a little bit of explaining for some of the, the impact that we, we see there on, on the green. We'll move to the next slide, please. Uh, so on pork imports, just a similar snapshot to the one I showed earlier on beef. So this is the first half of 2019 last year. Um, pork imports into Canada were up in 2019 as a consequence of increased Canadian export growth to Asia, stronger consumption, and some supply um, issues that we had here in Canada caused by the porcine scene epidemic diarrhea virus. Um, Canadian imports of pork were expected uh, pre-COVID to be flat in 2020. And as you can see here, the US is a dominant player. Uh, Denmark, Germany, Spain, and Poland are, are also exporting pork here. Next slide, please. Uh, just briefly to cover on sort of what meat consumption looks like in Canada or was looking like prior to COVID. Um, essentially, total consumer beef demand has remained relatively steady in recent years, despite increasing prices, um, but increased competition from other proteins, plant-based proteins, and changing consumer attitudes has placed downward pressure on demand. The Canadian population is increasing, but our growth is primarily driven by immigration from other countries, and many of those countries are, are those where regular beef consumption might be less normal. Um, if immigrants eventually embrace a more typical North American diet, beef consumption may increase in the longer term, but this could be slow to materialize. Um, domestic pork consumption was expected to see sustained growth in Canada through 2020. Increased consumption um, was a result of the increasing population and growth in per capita consumption, um, which has seen small but sustained growth since 2017. Pork prices in Canada were competitive over the last year, given export restrictions in China um, that Canada was facing and increased supply as Canada rebounded from the PBD 
uh, virus challenges in 2019. You can also see there how the shift has uh, occurred in terms of different proteins. So um, the sort of rise of chicken as a, as a protein of interest for Canadian consumers um, with pork and beef being a little bit more balanced there in, in 2018. We'll move to the next slide. Uh, so I just want to cover the, the Canadian tariff rate quota a little bit. So um, there is a, a tariff rate quota for beef in Canada, um, which has several different reserves. Uh, there are specific ones for New Zealand and Australia. And then there's an MFN pool that's for imports from non-eligible um, FCA countries. Um, so in the tariff rate quota, imports within access commitment um, are tariff free, and those outside of access commitment are subject to a TRQ uh, or sorry, a tariff of about 26.5%. Um, currently under the CETA agreement, the UK uh, enjoys duty-free access on beef, um, and we also have duty-free access on pork and lamb separately. Um, so that's just sort of an overview of how the, the TRQ works for Canada. Okay. We're gonna move to the next slide. So covering the US market, and we will move forward to the next slide from there. Um, so just kind of a bit of a, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the, the size and scope and dominance of the U.S. Uh, in terms of meat production, but just a bit of a visual here to show you sort of the, the balance in 2019 and the forecasts in 2020 and 2021 prior to COVID for um, production for the four major species. Um, obviously a very significant, massive production industry. Um, and producing billions of pounds of commercial beef um, and pork. Uh, so we will scoot to the next slide. And yes, as you very well know, the US is the biggest producer of beef in the world, um, ranking significantly higher than uh, all the other countries on there. Um, and as they are such a big producer, um, they obviously have a significant self-sufficiency for production of, of the protein as well. We'll move to the next slide. This is just to give you a quick overview, again, more for a reference for the future for some of the biggest US domestic producers. I'm sure many of these will be very well known to you. Um, and I've also covered the top livestock slaughtering stakes there. Um, Cisco Corp on there is one that you, you may be familiar with from the food service perspective in the UK as well. Uh, they control about 16% market share of the US food service industry and have more than 500,000 clients. Uh, they're also extremely active here in Canada. So from a food service perspective, they and Gordon Food Service are some of the biggest, um, most significant food service suppliers um, across all kinds of food and drink categories. Um, and they have uh, almost sort of strong monopolies on a lot of um, major accounts. We'll move to the next slide. Just covering a little bit on imports. So despite the fact that the US is such a significant producer, um, they do still import a significant amount of, of beef, so there is still a lot of opportunity there. In 2019, they brought in about 3 billion pounds of beef, um, and just as of April 2020, already uh, about a, a billion pounds of beef has been imported into the market, a 3.3% increase over the last year. The four main countries of origin are Canada, which is no surprise, they have about 26% of the share of imports. Australia coming up with 24%, Mexico 19%, and New Zealand with 14%. Um, the majority of, of imported beef from outside North America is destined for food service. Some products like Never Ever Beef, Australian tenderloins, um, Uruguayan 100% grass-fed beef are going into retail. And we've also, I'll get to it in a minute, we've seen a bit of a shift with COVID. Um, Irish Celtic beef from Keepak was being promoted just uh, this St. Pat St. Patrick's Day in a Massachusetts-based um, supermarket called Roche Bros. Um, and in 2019, on the lamb front, there was about 218 million pounds of lamb that was imported to the United States. Um, and it's very much dominated, as I'm sure you will be aware, by Australia and New Zealand. Next slide, please. Um, and so why is so much beef being produced and brought into the market? As I'm sure you're also aware, the US is uh, the biggest meat consumer in the world. So you'll see in the light purple line up there, um, their level of meat consumption. Um, Canada is there as well in a darker purple, so also quite high, though that's been a little bit on the, the decline. Um, and then obviously you've got the UK there as well. So significantly higher meat consumption in general, um, despite the rise of um, meat alternatives becoming very popular in both markets. 
there still is a, a lot of demand for, for protein and, and meat. Um, and we're seeing the rise of keto diets and a focus on sort of less processed foods um, also influencing that. Next slide, please. Um, and just, you know, a similar breakdown to the one I showed you on Canada in terms of what the US consumer is choosing in terms of meat products. Um, again, here you'll see poultry has really risen up in recent years um, as the, the most significant uh, choice of, of meat product. Next slide, please. And then just to give you a bit of a, I think Suzanne is gonna touch on, um, you know, state consumption and stuff like that a little bit later, but um, overall meat demand by state, this is for both um, uh, steaks and ground beef kind of generalized. Uh, you'll see that there is very significant meat consumption sort of in some of the central states of the country. Um, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see when you actually split it out between ground beef and the finer cuts, uh, this actually changes the picture a little bit. Um, so the demand for steak is highest in California, Nevada, Washington, Oklahoma, Minnesota, Illinois, Florida, and New York. Um, steak demand is lowest in sort of the traditional Midwest regions, so Idaho, Utah, Missouri, and Appalachian regions, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia. Um, but very much that is where you'll see more consumption of ground beef in those in those parts of the country. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll move on to the next slide there. Um, and one more thing before we move on to some policy bits. Um, Americans were very much eating out more and more, and this would have been the same for Canada. So prior to COVID, uh, the share of food um, at home was 45.2% and food away was 54%. So you can see over the years um, how much um, North American consumers and US consumers in particular were starting to consume more in restaurants and eat less at home. Um, and that has obviously started to change. We'll move on to the next slide. So I'm just gonna dwell a little bit on some US trade policy on the slide for a moment. Um, so I wanna give a bit of an overview about the US beef TRQ as we are coming up on getting our first shipments of um, British beef into the, the US market. Um, so there is a tariff rate quota in place in the United States um, and it has an access commitment of about 65,000 tons annually. Um, so the UK will currently sit in what's called the other countries tariff rate quota um, and imports within that access commitment are duty free imports over that access commitment are tariffed at 26.4% so similar to the Canadian one, um, but it, it is a very significant quota in terms of size. Um, other countries that use this quota include Ireland, Japan, the Netherlands, France, Lithuania, Lithuania, Namibia and Brazil. The TRQ is offered on a first come first serve basis. So essentially at the beginning of the year, um, importers will apply for quota on behalf of uh, the, the companies they wanna bring product in from, um, and it gets allocated throughout the year. Um, it, the usage has been very slow this year. So as of June 20th, only about 6.76% of the quota was filled. Um, in previous years though, it has achieved 100% fill rate. Um, so Brazil regained access to the U.S. Uh, this year for their beef and down the road they could potentially become a significant user of the other country's quota. Um, but this year I think they still have a lot of building to do. Um, other countries uh, like Australia or New Zealand, uh, for example, that have negotiated their own separate quota through free trade agreements, um, they can't use the other country's quota. So you're not competing with those countries for this quota. They have their own um, quotas that have been agreed um, and in many instances are going to be phased out over the next few years so they'll have unlimited access. Canada and Mexico, as I mentioned earlier, have essentially unlimited access to the USMCA agreement. Um, in the past couple years, I mentioned the other countries quota has filled very quickly to 100%. That was primarily because of Nicaragua, which utilized about 40 to 50,000 um, tons last year. Um, now the that country is part of the CAFTA agreement with the US, that's come in line. So Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Costa Rica all have separate access and will no longer participate in the other country's quota. Um, so that is just sort of a bit of an overview of how the quota works. I'm conscious, uh, don't have a lot of time to go into that. It's a bit complicated. So if anyone has questions on that, we can definitely pick them up later. 
I also wanted to touch on the Airbus dispute. So those of you who are exporting pork will be very familiar with this. Um, so under a dispute that's over aircraft between the United States and, and the EU, 25% um, tariffs have been applied to pork products from the UK that are exported to the USA. Um, USTR, the US Trade Representative, called for comments in a federal register notice recently to review possible revisions to the list of EU goods that are subject to those countermeasures. Um, and they're looking for comments on whether um, products should be maintained or removed, whether the, um, the duty rate should be increased. Um, so we're definitely, our team is engaging through HDB and, um, and with exporters directly to really encourage you to have your, if you are exporting currently and you are suffering from these tariffs, to encourage your US partners to submit comments into this review. It's open until the 26th of July um, to essentially comment on uh, your sort of views on it and, and having your US partners um, advocate on your behalf to have these tariffs removed. Um, uh, and, and, keep, and also keep us informed of how this is impacting your business because it's very useful for us and for our team in Washington to understand um, uh, how, how it's impacting you and how you're trying to mitigate it um, and what it's going to affect your business in the future. Um, so we're continuing to raise this issue. We take this, we take it very seriously. We're raising it at the highest levels with the US administration and we're working with other Airbus na nations such as France, Germany and Spain and the EU to push for negotiated settlements. We will use the UK-US free trade agreement as a platform to focus on how we can remove both tariff and non-tariff barriers uh, to trade across both countries. Um, so speaking of the US FTA, uh, we've had two rounds so far and things are moving very, very quickly. Uh, we have another round coming up this summer. Um, I know many of you on the line are very interested in what a UK-US FTA is gonna mean for you uh, domestically. The government's been very clear that any future trade deal must work for UK consumers and businesses and uphold our high regulatory standards. Um, I don't really have any other information I can share with you beyond that comment at this time. Um, but I, I can say that from an export perspective, I think there are definitely some great opportunities for UK exporters. Um, I've already mentioned it as a potential dialogue for, or platform for dialogue on the Airbus tariffs, which are a huge concern to us. Um, it also provides an opportunity for the dialogue necessary to get things like the small ruminant rule published. Um, this is a rule around um, get, that's essentially um, causing uh, us to not have access for lamb currently. So that's something we'd very much like to see resolved in the future. Um, and of course, it provides great opportunities to explore other tariff barriers like TRQs um, and the one that I've just outlined on beef as well as non-tariff barriers. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so just going to briefly cover the impact on the North American red meat market from COVID-19. We'll move on to the next slide from there. Um, so I'm going to spend the next few slides just looking at the past five months and how COVID-19 has impacted the meat sector. So the subsequent sli slides um, are really from a North American perspective. A lot of the commentary I've pulled out here is from the U.S. So um, if I don't specifically call out that it's relevant to Canada, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of the US, but with the market being so integrated, most of the points here are common to both. So going back to February 2020, um, sort of normal times, if you will, the, the issues on the mind in the North American industry were really these. Um, they were looking at African swine fever's disruption of livestock and meat markets, um, trade tensions, uh, particularly between the US and China and Canada and China, um, and the influence on agri-food markets, uh, changes to global and domestic red meat demand, uh, U.S. growth in beef production and pork production, um, largely as a result of uh, expanded exports into Asia because of African swine fever. The global economic impact of the coronavirus was starting to come through, but concerns were primarily around exports to Asia. It wasn't really as much of a domestic issue quite at that point. Um, food preferences were shifting. Obviously, we've we'd been seeing a rise of um, meat alternatives for some time, but domestic demand for red meat was remaining robust and people were thinking about China's ability to rebuild its hog herd, which I know um, you'll have heard a lot about on the last presentation, if any of you joined the, the Asia one uh, that um, HTB did last month. If we can move on to the next slide. So getting into March, uh, this is when the COVID-19 um, 
really hit the North American market. Panic buying of meat began in earnest in mid-March. We saw a seismic shift in demand from food service to retail, similar to what you would have seen in the UK. Retailers bid up the price of beef from packers. Beef packer margins swelled to over $600 a head. There were high US beef slaughter rates to try to keep up with demand. There were over 40,000 more um, slaughters per week than it had been expected. We started to see unemployment skyrocketing and a recession looming on the horizon. And a large number of hogs were in the US production pipeline because of expected export demand for Asia. Uh, and we saw very, very high slaughter. So uh, over 11% over last year, again, with that demand coming in, in the domestic market. Leading up to that point, the US had been exporting about 28% of its pork production over the prior few months. Um, we also saw lamb retail sales in the US rise during this period. Uh, up 54% in the week ending March 15th as consumers were trying to get their hands on any meat products that they, they possibly could. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. So looking at April, um, a lot of the consumer stockpiling had ran its course for the time being. Um, so we start to, started to see some softening in that demand um, as consumers were, they had their freezers full of products. Um, food service outlets were shuttered. Uh, demand dipped significantly on the food service side. Products with high food service exposure saw that dip and really felt that in particular. Restaurants were beginning to make the pivot to takeout and delivery. Um, food service products were beginning to transition to retail and packs were changing and regulations were making some amendments to allow for retail packs or for food service formats to go into retail. Um, slaughter rates were cut back significantly because of this dip in the food service demand. Um, UK exports uh, volumes remained strong at that time, so pork exports were actually up 40% over the prior year. We'll go to the next slide. And this is just like a, another little snapshot to show you what Canadian beef uh, imports looked like from January to April 2020. Um, so we saw large increases in Canadian imports, particularly of ground beef. Um, I didn't yet have the May import data in front of me, but I expect it was extremely significant as we will get to in a moment. Um, UK fresh uh, imports were low at that time, um, you know, potentially with the, the food service being disrupted being the cause of that, um, but UK frozen was extremely high. Um, total import value from the UK in 2019, as I had mentioned earlier, was just over $13 million. Um, and so we saw a significant increase for 2020 with, um, if you look at the frozen numbers, there are over 10 million just in the first quarter. So definitely some opportunities uh, happening at, at that moment in time. Um, and prior to kind of uh, the COVID hitting, we were seeing some demand for, um, for ground beef in Canada um, because there was a bit of a North American shortage in general of, of lean ground beef. We'll move on to the next slide. So May is when things really hit the fan. Um, so COVID-19 infiltrated meat processing facilities. I'm sure you'll have all seen lots of the coverage there. Um, it forced the closure of a number of slaughtering plants and slowed production at many others. The U.S. pig crop um, was estimated to have underkilled by about 3.6 million head between March and May. There was some euthanization of pigs, but many were put on low energy diets. Pork, parker, pork packer margins were over $100 a head. Beef production plunged and there was a flurry of buying interest with price levels soaring. Additional waves of stockpiling took place following coverage of the disruption. I remember uh, the, the day that um, the plants, the cargo plants in Alberta closed, trying to uh, go to the grocery store the next day. The lineups were just around the block at about 7 a.m. in the morning. It was very significant and consumers reacted very quickly. Um, retail prices of beef uh, in particular surged uh, across North America. Um, President Trump issued an executive order requiring meat plants to remain in operation. Um, and the May disruption of processing plants led to a big backlog of cattle in feed yards. Cattle feeders, cattle feeders responded to the crisis by slashing feed yard placements, which can set up a, will set up a little bit of a tight situation for this fall. Um, steer and heifer carcass weights were already very heavy before the plants started closing, but the problem became more serious in May. We can go to the next slide. So I've just pulled out here a couple of the headlines from newspapers in May. Um, and just so you can see how significant some of this was. So McDonald's Canada for several years now has been promoting the fact that they only use Canadian beef um, and they started having to import beef from the US um, amid some of the Canadian supply issues. 
Uh, the two of the plants um, in Canada were Alberta meat plants that make it made up about 70% of our beef processing capabilities. So um, I mentioned earlier how um, in, in our market, there's a significant amount of consolidation that's very, um, very demonstrative of that. Um, and US consumers also rushed out with the, the shortages that they had um, in, in their uh, neck of the woods. Um, uh, but we had uh, governments essentially reassuring the public that there was plenty to go around, that we you know, overproduce a lot of product and we have, we have the meat available. Um, it really just was an issue with getting the product to market. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so just looking at June, um, so retail prices were remaining high in, in the first half of June, but now we're starting to reduce. Um, the packing plants did a very good job of recovering from the disruption. The slaughter is approximately 95% of normal now, um, but an estimated uh, close to a million head of, of fed cattle went unslaughtered in April and May. So there's a huge backlog of cattle in US feed yards. Cash cattle prices retreated. Um, beef packer margins were still high at $500 a head, but on the decline, pork packer mar margins were back down to $35 a head. Um, the supply is large again as demand from food service remains low. Restaurants are beginning to open but are still constrained. International demand for U.S. exports is low. Um, we're expecting a 3% decline in U.S. beef exports for 2020 as a whole, um, which is quite different to the, the very positive situation they were forecasting previously. Um, U.S. senators are probing U.S. meat producers on domestic shortages versus exports. So they're aware that, um, you know, during this time when there were issues getting meat to market uh, domestically, there was still a lot of exporting uh, that was happening. Um, they're also asking USDA to rethink regulations um, around sort of the meat industry and impediments to diversify the processing industry and have called to ease restrictions on product labeling, food safety inspections, and other rules that they say impact their smaller meat packers from getting a foothold in a highly concentrated sector. Um, whilst a lot of the bigger players were affected, um, you did see some of the smaller meat packers uh, taking advantage of the opportunities where they were able to do so. Um, uh, the US ground beef uh, went crazy. So I remember sort of at this time, um, and in May, we had a lot of interest in, in ground beef from anywhere you could get it from us here in Canada. Um, so ground beef in the US saw a dollar increase of 25.8%, um, but volumes were down overall uh, during kind of mid-June. Consumers were looking for equally versatile but less expensive alternatives in beef as these prices rose, and some of the smaller proteins stepped in. So we saw an increase in sales of ground turkey, chicken, pork, and even exotic meats like bison. Um, and they all saw double digit gains in both dollars and volume during the period. Ground pork was up 21% in dollars and 13% in volume. Um, all right, we shall move to the next slide, please. So the near term outlook. Um, so over the summer, uh, there's going to be pressure on US cash cattle prices sustained as the backlog of fed cattle is processed. Um, steer weights are now 52 pounds heavier than they were this time last year. Animals are carrying a lot of fat. Pork prices are expected to remain low. Um, in the autumn, a bit of a reduction in the beef supply created by light spring cattle placements um, in March, April, and May could arise uh, come the autumn. Uh, potential higher um, pork placing by Q4 early 2021, um, resulting from pay herd liquidation in May and June. Um, some industry downsizing is expected in the pork industry in the U.S., which will reduce supply, but in the much longer term. Um, now, the big thing really is addressing the macroeconomic impact of the crisis. Unemployment has surged to around 13 percent. Um, beef and pork demand will probably be hampered by high unemployment through 2020 and probably well into 2021. So there are some economic headwinds there. Um, a lot of the COVID-19 government benefit programs will cease by autumn. Food prices will be up overall due to the additional costs of COVID-19 and health and safety compliance throughout the supply chain. In Canada in particular, our dollar is very much tied to the price of oil, so has softened considerably, meaning Canadian purchasing power for imports is, is somewhat reduced. Um, experts are, however, remaining buyers to, or cautioning buyers to remain vigilant for resurgence in coronavirus infections that could cause packing plants to shut down once again. So, um, you really can never say never with this. Um, 
I think a lot of uh, buyers are um, not wanting to take on really expensive product at this time, um, but at the same time, they are um, wanting to hedge themselves against any potential future disruptions. Next slide, please. So just general in terms of kind of where we're at um, from a recovery or reopening status, um, the major cities across North America were the hardest hit and the re are reopening more slowly than other um, more rural areas. Um, the US, as I'm sure you'll have seen in the news, has had a significant number of, of cases. Um, Canada has as well, kind of compared to our population, but we are on a more of a downward trajectory in Canada. Um, food service establishments in most places, um, you know, have been very limited since March and are gradually reopening um, for on-premise service under strict guidance. Um, and though many of them have reopened to dine in, there are still spacing requirements that will depress sales and a general reluctance on the part of consumers to return to restaurants while the virus is still, um, still spreading. So in the past two weeks, in particular, we've seen a substantive growth in the number of cases in the U.S. Um, and the growth is really driven by outbreaks in Florida, Texas, Arizona, and California, um, though other states are also experiencing an upward trajectory in new cases. Reopenings in key markets like the Northeast and California have been slow, and many states that have reopened are now pulling back in response to the outbreaks. For example, yesterday, the California governor ordered restaurants in Los Angeles and 18 other counties to immediately shut back down their dining rooms uh, to stem the spike in new COVID-19 cases. Um, and to avoid a recurrence in their outbreaks, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut have begun to require anyone traveling from at least 16 other states with high rates of COVID to quarantine for 14 days. Um, in Canada, Ontario, and Quebec have been the hardest hit with nearly 90% of Canada's COVID-19 cases, despite only having about 60% of the population. Most cases are concentrated in the greater Toronto and greater Montreal areas. Um, and, and those part, those cities have been reopening at a slower pace. Um, in British Columbia, restaurants, cafes, and bars have reopened under enhanced protocols with less than 50% capacity and sufficient distancing measures from May 22nd. In Ontario, um, same establishments are reopened for dining, um, but for outdoor areas only, such as patios, curbside, parking lot adjacent, um, as of June 12th. Um, Toronto and Niagara regions uh, were held back a little bit later. Restaurants outside Montreal reopened from June 15th, including dining rooms and terraces, um, but with protocols around distancing, and Montreal restaurants reopened on June 22nd. Um, international tourism is expected to be closed throughout the summer of 2020, and international travel is also currently limited. Um, and we're seeing significant growth in e-commerce and new routes to the customer. Um, one of the things that's going to be particularly game-changing in North America um, is the entry of Ocado Technologies' as partnership with two of our biggest retailers. So some of you might be aware that Canada and the U.S. are very much um, behind the U.K. in terms of um, their e-commerce uh, being established for grocery retail. Um, this year, Ocado, which many of you will know from the U.K., obviously, has partnered with Sobeys, which is Canada's second largest grocery retailer to open um, AI-driven customer fulfillment centers, which will really change the game and their ability to deliver e-commerce. Uh, and they have also partnered with Kroger's in the US and plan to open, I think, up to 20 uh, CFCs in the future there. So um, we're really gonna see a significant change and we've it's very much needed because we've had very intense demand for e-commerce as um, consumers have sought to avoid actually physically visiting the grocery store. Next slide, please. Um, so just very briefly here, opportunities and challenges. Um, before COVID-19, when I'm, when I'm talking to exporters, I would have emphasized, you know, a focus on opportunities around food service, um, where products can be really, high-end products can be really differentiated, breed and feed specificity, really pushing those stories along, um, the UK story in animal welfare, sustainability, farm and grass making sure you have a commitment to the market and investment. Um, the US and Canadian markets are very competitive, sophisticated markets, as you'll have seen in this presentation. So really important um, to be committed to the market and to, to get involved in marketing. I think there are lots of niche opportunities to build brand UK, though it is very competitive. I think the UK has an incredible story um, and your products are brilliant. So I think there was a lot of opportunity there. Um, and it's very important to get compliance right as we're going along through all of this. Post-COVID, 
all of the above is still very important and I think there are opportunities, um, but we have to watch the food service recovery, um, explore maybe some specialty butchers and, and looking at retail and new distribution models um, such as direct to consumer butcher boxes, that sort of thing. Need Anyone who wants to be exporting here needs to be speaking to the emerging um, home body economy. Um, and really there's gonna be an increased focus on local here. Um, consumers more than ever are aware of the, the, the supply chain um, and where their product's coming from. And so that will be something to contend with. And I would say stay connected with DIT for opportunities. Our team is mapping and staying alive to gaps caused by disruption and panic buying. Um, so it's really important to stay tuned to us and obviously through Susanna and the HDB team so that we can connect you guys with those opportunities. Uh, and then next slide, uh, just a final plea from my team, a reminder for those of you who are exporting to Canada, we've had a couple instances over the last little while of, of issues around shipping marks and compliance. Um, and when that's happened, our team sometimes has to go and have containers released um, from the warehouse working with the CFIA. So just a reminder, um, we sent one out through Phil and Susanna a little while back, uh, but just a reminder on that compliance, there's some points here for future reference of, of issues that we've come across in the past. Um, and we're really keen to, to continue to work with you guys to make sure we're getting this right across the board, because it does impact on the UK's reputation and on the importer's reputation when, when it just doesn't get right. Um, so that's all from me. I'm, hopefully I haven't gone too far over time. I'm gonna pass over to Susanna now to uh, cover a little bit more on the marketing opportunities. Hi, thank you, Dana. This has been a, a very good and detailed presentation and uh, good afternoon to you all. And um, I'm Susanna Morris. I'm the Senior Expert Manager for North America and I will go in through the marketing North America. I will take up my video and we'll start the uh, presentation. Um, I will start just very quickly with the status of the market access on North America. As you can see, Canada, we are open for beef, lamb and pork. US for pork, we are waiting to list some companies for beef. Lamb, we're not able to, um, to export at the moment uh, until the TSE rule for uh, small ruminants is lifted. And, uh, and then we've got Mexico. We had an audit uh, last February just before COVID-19. And, uh, and then there is, a, I, I believe there is a bit of a potential there for lamb uh, once COVID is over for food and the tourist sector. Next, please. Uh, here, the next uh, slide is just to put into context um, the numbers of livestock on each country and, and the species. The UK is strong on the production of sheep, but not so much on the number of pigs. And on cattle, we are just under Canada, but we are lower um, than US and, and Mexico. And uh, you probably will be thinking, why am I stating the obvious? Well, because these numbers uh, tell me how I should approach the North American market. We can't compete on price. We can't export large number of products. So we need to differentiate our products from the local with a very strong story. We need to identify our target audience, either food service, specialty grocers, retail, butchers. Also accommodate our messaging with market trends. To, uh, to target small numbers of regions or states or provinces, we cannot target the whole of the countries. They are too big. We haven't got the resources or the number of product. Be conscious that we are entering into a high value uh, product with a high value product. And, and as you have seen from Dina's uh, presentation, there's a high competition. Next, please. And next. Um, okay, uh, what we know about Canada, the Canadian population is about 38 million and 90% of the Canadians live within 100 miles of the US border. Canada is one of the most multicultural countries in the world, as you can see on the graphic on the top left. Um, international migration remains the main contributor to the population. Without it, Canada's population growth could be close to zero in 20 years as the population continues to age. More than half of the Canadians live just uh, in two provinces, Ontario and Quebec. 
and uh, also because of the huge land mass. In fact, Canada is the, is the world's second largest country after Russia. There is a dispersed population, which you have to have in mind because then the, lo the cost of logistics is quite high and the need for an optimized distribution network. Find the right commercial partner for you. There are two official languages, French and English. Bear that in mind for your documentation and how to label your products. Canada's retail market is a mature and largely consolidated with five major stores that represent 62% of the market. The remaining 38 is for 7,000 independent and convenience stores. The main chains are Loblos, Sobeys, Walmart, Metro, Costco and Whole Foods. And one thing I really and I really want to emphasize here is you need to place the customer at the core of your strategy. Customer service and support are very important to Canadians, Americans and Mexico. And that really starts from the documentation compliance when you are exhibit, um, exporting. The food service sector includes the commercial and the non-commercial. The commercial includes the quick service restaurants, food service, caterers and drinking establishments. And non-commercial is um, the institutional, retail and, and others. Before COVID-19, the top uh, Canadian provinces with the most restaurant sales were Quebec, Saskatchewan and Ontario. Next, please. These are the market trends. I will go really quickly through them. Um, the millennials are really actively looking for ethical meat. There is a demand for grass-fed, demand for certified humane, um, this is a US trademark that enforces standards, but there are Canadians that they are going over the, uh, the border and um, acquiring this, uh, this trademark. In Canada, there is no government standards enforced through annual inspections. Also, and there is a growing ethnic market, as I, I showed you in the uh, last uh, slide, and this could be an, an opportunity for halal lamb, for example. Growing awareness and interest in food service and the food, uh, food supply chain. This was very evident during COVID-19 as consumers, some consumers, avoided going to the supermarkets and favoring purchasing from the local butcher uh, and also to support local produce. Next, please. This is really emphasizing once again that there is no independent inspection or verification for the different labels. Next, please. These are uh, different promotional activities that we have done very recently. One May uh, 2019 was CL in Toronto, which was retail focus. And then the RC show uh, just recently in March, and that was the, my last show this year. And that was for food service. Next, please. The promotional activities that we're going to do from now on are going to be uh, using more social media and if COVID permits for next year, we would like to go again to the RC show uh, only if the uh, safety measures are going to be in place and we do get a vaccine for COVID-19. Next, please. Okay, now we pass over to uh, the US. The US is a population of meat lovers and they are really proud of it, as you will see in my next slide, please. And we have here a beefed off truck with a number plate where it says beef, but then again, it is the Florida Beef Council. But then we've got a lady here that probably was showing me head tattoo of a pig with all its scots. Next, please. Now here we're going to go through the uh, DNA of, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> the DNA of uh, United States. Uh, US population is of 331 million already an increase of 20 million in the last 10 years and um, and this is uh, an increase like uh, the size of Romania or Chile and even bigger than Belgium with the 11 million population. And the map here in the middle um, is um, it's about the, and the Hispanic and Latino Americans, um, which are the second largest ethnic group with 55 million people, or 16.7% of the national uh, population. Also, I want to say that by 2050, there will not be a single racial or ethnic majority, something to bear in mind. 
on the right map of the United States, um, we've got the US Asian population, which grew by 46% from 2000 to uh, 2010, and which constituted the largest increase of any major racial group during this period. The Chinese American population is approximately of 4 million, and they are based in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Illinois. And on the far left, there's another map that constitutes the Muslim population, which is of 4 million. And by 2050, uh, there is expected to be 8 million. Most live in Illinois, Michigan, New York, also, in there's a smaller population in Texas, Florida, and California. Next, please. Um, here is the slide um, is showing us um, that in 20 years, half of the population will live in eight states, and that is California, Texas, Florida, New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Ohio, and Georgia. And the numbers that you can see on the right of the slide. Um, are the number of population of each of the states. And as you can see, California with 40 million is much bigger than the whole population of Canada. Something interesting is um, um, and to highlight is the CCPA that stands for the California Consumer Privacy Act. This is something similar to our GDPR. So please Bear this in mind if you are dealing with uh, California. Also, California has the fifth largest economy in the world with a total of 2.97 trillion US dollars. Next, please. So now we know where the people are going to live or where they are living. So now I just want to point out that the main grocery retailers' head offices, where are they based, and also the main uh, food shows. And just to um, name a few, not all of them, um, the uh, supermarkets, we've got Kroger in Ohio, Albertson in Idaho, Publix in Florida, HEB in Texas, Whole Foods Market in, in Texas as well. And then on shows, we've got uh, winter and summer fancy foods in San Francisco and New York. And we had the NRA show in Chicago. Next, please. This is another map that is going to, that is showing us where are the the most restaurants and bar dense U.S. cities. In broadly, we can say that coastal cities are restaurant cities and inland cities are bar cities. So the biggest restaurant city is in San Francisco with 39.3 restaurants per 10,000 households and other restaurant dens are New York, Boston, Seattle, San Jose in California. Uh, the city with the highest bar density is the queen of the estates is uh, New Orleans with uh, 8.6 bars per 10,000 households. Next, please. Consumer needs. Um, um, well, we, are, we have the transparency and integrity in the supply chain. We are able to offer traceability, humane animal treatment. We are constantly working on the high animal welfare, and we've been doing this since the 19th century. Creating better and healthier food service uh, and food systems. We are continuously working to decrease the, in the, um, the use of our inter antibiotics or at least control them. And since 1988, we haven't been using uh, hormones on our livestock. And also what is very, very important is the environmental and sustainability, which is something that we are continuously working on. And please, um, we have to remember that our cattle and uh, sheep are grass fed. And all that is packaged with the red tractors uh, certification standard. Next, week, uh, next please. Here's just an example of the different assurances, trademarks and certificates that you can find in the supermarkets on the meat trades. Uh, next, please. Grass-fed. What does it mean, grass-fed? Um, in the United States, grass-fed needs means 100% grass-fed. And the moment that you, you are giving to your cattle uh, cereals or grains, that won't constitute grass-fed. Next, please. 
Again, this is an example of how um, the meat is uh, presented in the uh, supermarkets and the labeling and also the graphics in the supermarket. Next, please. These are the different uh, um, promotional activities that we have done in the past. Um, we participated at the NRA show in Chicago twice. With the help of DIT, um, we did two outward missions, one to Winter Fancy Food in San Francisco and the Americas Food and Beverage in Miami. And also last year, we had an inward mission of five sheep representatives from the US. Next, please. Now I want to introduce you to Melissa and Sari. Melissa on the left, Sari on the right. Uh, they work for the Mesolam Group, um, who are our new PR agency in the United States. Next, please. So uh, with Melissa and Sari, we're working on um, a plan um, how to go forward and, and promote um, our meat. So our main objectives in the Americas is to increase our brand awareness for Br uh, British beef and pig meat and to increase our market share. Uh, how are we going to do that? Well, using social media where, and also traditional media where we can do PRs, direct mail, blogs, emails, search engine optimization, advertising online, webinars and seminars, and online events and personal events when uh, COVID is over or when it's controlled. Um, who we will be targeting? Our main target is the meat buyers, and that could be from the speciality grocers, butchers, chefs, and also we will be reaching out to the media. And the areas that we will be targeting will be the northeast, southeast, and southwest of America. Next, please. Um, we are since last week. Uh, we are live in Instagram and Facebook, and our handle is Meet the UK Exporters. Next, please. Our calendar of activities. Uh, this is what we've got planned at the moment. is not set in stone because the market continuously is moving and changing. So we're quite flexible with that, and that perhaps is the beauty of social media. But I will highlight that I'm thinking of doing a promotion on British bacon um, uh, using uh, our pork belly and then uh, later on in the year to do another promotion on uh, roast beef just before Christmas. Um, with regards to COVID-19, well, uh, the, the shows, it just depends if COVID-19 is, is controlled. As I said earlier, we will be trying to um, uh, participate at the RC show in Toronto, then also at the NRA show in Chicago and bring some exporters over so, to understand the market and to um, uh, just talk to different uh, uh, importers and distributors. And also we would like to bring over uh, some US journalists to visit the UK. Next, please. Pass it, uh, next, please. We're passing over to uh, Mexico. And uh, Mexico has a population of 129 million and Greater Mexico City has 21.3 million in population, which is um, more or less similar to the Netherlands and is the double the, the population of Greece. Pig meat is an important protein for the population in Mexico. Therefore, there is a great demand for it, but the national production can't cover it. So there is a need uh, to import. Uh, consumption is around 2.2 million tons. The production of pig meat in Mexico is 1.7 million tons. So the number of the total of imports, 84% um, is covered by US and Canada. And out of that total is 84% from the US and 16% from Canada. Most of the imports are fresh and chilled, but 11% are imported uh, frozen. As you can see, there's uh, some uh, red marks there. Uh, that um, uh, signifies that the consumption is highly concentrated in a few states, which are state of Mexico, Mexico City, Veracruz, Jalisco and Puebla. And then the blue square is um, the states of Mexico that, where they spend most on pork, followed by Colima, which is just underneath Jalisco, Tlaxcala and the state of Mexico. The states with lower consumption are in the north of Mexico. Next, please. Here is a slide where 
there is a table indicating the distribution of meats in Mexico by states. So we have wholesales, retail, supermarkets, and grocery. Just to have in mind, butcher shops sell around 55% of the total product. Public market is the second with uh, 21% and 11% supermarkets. The main supermarket chains in Mexico are Walmart, Superama, Soriana, Chedraui, Mega Hypermarket, City Market, La Comer, HEB, Costco and Sam's Club. Next please. And these are the different um, um, shows that we have done just to um, um, do a little bit of investigation in the market. Um, and that was um, always with the help of DIT, and that was Antar Guadalajara in 2018. The, uh, we also went to the National Conference for Pig Producers, and finally uh, we brought over a, a group of pork representatives as an inward in mission, and, um, and that's all for me. Thank you very much, and I hand over back to Phil. Okay, Susanna, thank you. Um, I'll invite Dana and Susanna to uh, just pop their cameras on for a, uh, for a moment for the question session. So a couple of really comprehensive uh, presentations there in terms of the situation in that North American marketplace and coming on to South America also. Um, I I've got, uh, we've got some questions that are coming, which I'll, I'll, I'll go uh, through, uh, but thanks to the, uh, to the speakers. I I'll remind you as delegates that there are um, uh, the ability, or there's a feedback survey after this uh, session, which will appear on your screen, which I'd encourage you to complete, helps us shape the next uh, session. And the video will be with you uh, within the next 24 hours, fingers crossed. So on the questions, if I can just, uh, just pose uh, some of these. Dana, you mentioned the Airbus Boeing uh, tariff dispute and the 25% tariff that the pork sector is currently um, facing and the um, consultation that's currently going on for businesses that, that are affected uh, by that. I wonder if you could just expand on that a little. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> Sure. So um, essentially, with the ongoing dispute, every 120 days or so, USTR, uh, the US Trade Representative, is able to sort of review um, the, the items that are on the list and um, review whether they should maintain the same items, take some off, add some new ones, um, and whether they should change the, the value, the ad valorem value that's applied. So uh, we just had a notification uh, last week, essentially, that USTR is conducting this review. And when they do that, they write out to industry, essentially asking for feedback. And the kind of purposes is to write out to American industry asking for feedback. So that's why I, I was encouraging companies to get their US partners to feedback into that. Um, and then there's sort of a month long period in which you can submit comments to USTR that they'll review. Um, and as it stands right now, under the review, um, they've included a list of other potential products to be added to the list. Um, none of those are really uh, in, in your sectors or things like gin or chocolate, um, but they're also looking at the potential to um, change the, the value of the tariff um, from 25%, and they ask the question of, should this be increased to 100%? So, um, to be very, you know, forthcoming with you, that that risk is always there, um, but we we very much hope that that won't be the case, and that's why we're working to encourage um, companies to feedback in that that commentary. Um, and so, if that were to happen, at, it's the 26th of July by which the comments are due, and then USTR will have sort of another review, and then they will um, release what they decide to to do. So that's essentially. Um, what they're looking at is something called carousel retaliation, which is something that we very much don't want to see. So, um, yeah. So you'd actively encourage businesses that have been impacted by that to feed into the consultation to uh, underpin the arguments, yeah? Absolutely, and, and please also let us know how this is affecting you. Um, my team very much works with Washington so that they understand kind of the impacts that this is having on business and any concerns you're having. And the more that we can feed that back into to wider government, um, the more kind of prepared we are to deal with the situations. Sure. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, and another question is around the um, the access post Brexit for the for the UK and and CETA agreement and so on. I wonder if you could briefly sum up where you think we will land on the first of July uh, at first of July, I beg your pardon, first of January, of course, and what that will uh, what that will look like. Sure. So um, I can't really speak too much in depth uh, in a public forum um, about too much on post Brexit issues, as you can imagine, because it's quite sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. But <laughs> so, yeah, so I, it's probably best if anyone has really specific questions around the future of CETA um, to for me to follow up directly so you can follow up with questions and we can kind of have a conversation offline. Um, but we do continue to talk with Canadian officials um, at the official level on a way forward of transitioning the CETA agreement, which is a European Union agreement. Um, and we're optimistic that a solution can be agreed once uh, for, for when we Brexit. So um, please feel free to follow up with me online and we can have more specific conversations about that. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, just picking up on one or two others here. Um, a, a sort of more less detailed, more uh, more vague question here about the North American, US, Canadian consumers view of um, products from the UK, particularly meat products uh, in terms of a consumer perception and attitude. Yeah, so I would, it's kind of broad. Um, I think that the thing that's really important to remember about North America is that it really is like having multiple different countries in one. So the US is almost like having 50 different states or 50 different countries um, in one and consumers across those states are gonna have different preferences. So a consumer in Los Angeles is gonna be very different to a consumer in Idaho. Um, I think in terms of consumer knowledge on this side of the pond of the UK, offer um, the UK is generally held in relatively high regard in terms of the food offer. I think a lot of people know um, have kind of this vision in their minds of UK food products coming from beautiful grassy farms with kind of heritage practices and that sort of thing. So um, I think in sort of consumers phase one thinking of the UK, um, sheep farming and livestock farming and you know breeds like Angus are familiar. But I do think that there is a lot of scope for education about sort of the finer points of the UK offer and for consumers to understand the quality and the taste. Um, I just spoke to an importer a couple of weeks ago who had imported um, some mutton into Canada from the UK for the first time. And he said, I worked in the US and Canada in you know, the, the sheep industry for 30 years and I've never seen something of such high quality. It's absolutely beautiful product. And, the people that I'm selling on to are so excited about it. So I think it's really important to get, you know, product being tasted, um, which I know is difficult right now. Um, but also just to really weave that story and some of the marketing efforts that Suzanne is planning and you guys are planning, we're really excited about. We're really excited to help amplify those um, and to make sure that story gets across. Great. That that's, leads me into the next question, actually. Well done, which was about uh, activity for you, Susanna. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, activity paused at the moment with the travel restrictions and so on. Perhaps you'd like to um, sort of comment about plans for the uh, for 2021 on the North American marketplace. Um, well, we are working um, and developing social media. Um, that that's also going to help us, even if the market is open or not, to travel. Um, and then if uh, the market opens um, for Canada and the US, we would like to um, to go and, and go to the shows and the RC show in Toronto and, and then also to revisit the NRA in, in Chicago. Because I always think even though we can do these presentations online and, and everything else, uh, the face-to-face -face is more powerful. I always think that anyway. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, I guess the uh, the message is there to our stakeholders. Uh, we'll be in touch in due course when the situation becomes a, a little bit clearer and uh, we're able to make concrete plans in terms of travels and uh, uh, and exhibitions and so on. Uh, That's right. Okay, I'm, I'm conscious of time now. We are a few minutes over and they, uh, there's a couple of Quick questions about standards. So Susanna used the 
uh, Red Tractor Standard uh, as an example of, uh, of a UK brand that might work in the American marketplace. Of course, there, there are others, including the PGIs and other quality standards that might find some traction. Um, and I think that's probably answered the questions that have come in around uh, around that marketplace and some of uh, uh, some of the things that we might see going forward. Of course, it's very difficult and changeable times at the moment with activity suspended and travel. Um, as we enter discussions around trade agreements and potential trade, there's a lot of unknowns there for the um, uh, for business. But clearly, the, our position is to try and uh, ensure ongoing trade with uh, with Canada as we've made uh, decent inroads, as uh, Dana highlighted earlier. And then, of course, we have growing opportunities in the US. Uh, and I said right at the outset that we're anticipating uh, approval and the first beef to be going to the US in uh, in the not too distant future after many years of uh, discussions and negotiations uh, by a myriad of uh, uh, government bodies with support from ourselves and others. So a new opportunity opening up as well as some challenges in the marketplace which can't be uh, can't be underestimated. So with that I'd like to thank you all for your attendance. Uh, please do fill in the feedback form to help us shape the uh, uh, future webinars. We will continue this series uh, and be in touch around uh, the next one once we set a date and, and map out the, uh, the subject matter. But with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I'd like to particularly to thank our speakers for their insightful and informative presentations. Please do reach out to us if you have any further questions or any areas you would like to clarify or points you would like to raise. Always delighted to hear from you. Uh, keep an eye out for the future webinars. And thank you very much for joining joining us today. And I wish you a pleasant afternoon and evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you.